All right, welcome to the Pirate Hour. Today is February 7th. It's Thursday. The time is 9.39. And uh, tonight we have Cory Doctorow as our guest. We are very happy to have him here. Um, Cory just gave a book signing event in uh, Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco for his new book, Homeland. He is a science fiction author, a futurist. Um, <laughs> not a future, not a presentist, presentist. <laughs> present, <laughs> no presentist. Uh, and a public speaker. So we're very happy to have him today. We don't have very much time, so we're just going to jump into the questions. Um, I have a couple questions from other pirates. Uh, the first relates to the first speech that I ever saw you give online, which was called The Coming War on General Computation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was really an inspiring speech for me. Uh, my friend Michael Stroud showed me that speech, and in that speech you discuss some, should we say, nightmare scenarios um, regarding a movement to prevent users from terminating processes running on their devices that could potentially work against their interests. And so Michael asks, what sort of relationship do you think these nightmare scenarios have with uh, sort of more benign software processes, I guess, like the ways that Apple locks down distribution of iPhone apps with iOS or Mac OS. Like, do you think that Apple's method of regulating access to apps is a separate direction from legislation that prevents users from exercising full control over their No, device? not at all. Or a first step. Yeah, no, no. I, it's actually, it's neither of those. So the thing is that um, there is that there is no functional difference between what Apple does and what um, other firms do um, the, the, and what may happen in the future. So what we've got is a regime where circumvention is prohibited just on its face, right? So, so removing an effective means of access control is, is prohibited on its face. And um, every, every uh, solution to a problem that involves um, making it so that computers can't contribute to that problem will involve some kind of access control. Right. And so uh, what Apple has is a not very effective means of access control that's really just effective enough to um, qualify for DMCA protection and a bunch of lawyers, which is why <laughs> you can't just walk into like your dry cleaners or the convenience store in the corner or like a guy with a, a table, you know, a card table on the street who's offering jailbreaking services, which is why you have to do like the equivalent of buying street heroin in order to get jailbroken, right? And the thing about like buying street heroin is that um, people who've been taking heroin for years and years and years and, you know, sort of have their habit under control and just, just think that they know what they're doing, sometimes buy heroin that's like a hundred times more pure than the stuff they're used to and die of overdoses, right? <laughs> because you don't know what you're getting. You download some random binary right. and you shove it into your phone using some exploit and you're like, well, now my phone is free. You have no idea what you've just done to your phone. <laughs> so um, what Apple's interested in is not so much making sure that you don't unlock your phone. What Apple's interested in is making sure that there is not um, AP computer science class where everybody is taught to jailbreak phones. Right. And not um, a string of, uh, of kiosks in like Best Buys around the country where people jailbreak phones. That's the thing that Apple gets. From from their anti from their their uh, circumvention device, their, their rather their anti circumvention protection on their their access control device in the in the machine, and so the the all those nightmare s scenarios are based on the idea that the state will continue to uh, increase the range of access controls <coughs> that it will offer this kind of protection to, um, and mm -hmm. you know one of the things that I think we're likely to hear is, well, Apple got it, and look at how successful they were. They briefly <laughs> had the highest market cap of any company right. in, the, in, the, uh, in the world. Clearly, this is good for American business and good for America. Right. We should be extending these kinds of access control, removal prohibitions, this kind of anti-circumvention uh, uh, rule to more and more <coughs> That's really interesting to me. Actually, that leads into my second question, because it seems like part of the thing that you emphasize is the anti-educational tool, or the the... the Part, the implication that people do not learn how to question when they are asked to disclose information about their lives. Um, and so that's, that's actually the, something that I wanted to talk to you about because uh, I'm a high school teacher and so I, I, sh I teach speech and I show students how to be persuasive and, and you know, make interesting arguments. And so I've been doing this experiment recently where I, sh I have my class of 14 year olds and I show them the, uh, the speech from the great dictator, Charlie Chaplin's greatest speech ever made, right? And it's like beautiful and inspiring and rhetorically powerful, right? But it's like, it's like 
very anti-militarist and, and freedom. And then after I show them that video, right after that, I show them your TED Talk, which is the, the talk about Facebook and how can we how can we teach our children to always jailbreak everything, hack everything, right? And and so after I, after I show them both these videos, I'm like, which which speech do you think is like which one do you like more? And they're like Charlie Chaplin, always, you know, like every time. And I, and, I, and, well, so I and so I ask he them, was you know, pretty good. well he it's was right, but that's sort of the point of the story is that I, I ask them afterwards. I always think that's interesting because. Because I, you know, I, I say, okay, students, look deep inside yourself. I really want you to think about, like, I'm going to ask you a serious question right now. Like, yes, it was a very rhetorically powerful speech, but are you going to be any different today than you were before you watched this, Charlie Chad? Do you think any differently about the world than you did before you saw this? Look deep inside yourself, and they say, no, I'm not going to be any, you know, I'm not going to act differently, you know. And then, well, here's a speech that we watch right after that that specifically identifies a problem that you are facing in your life right now today and provides steps that you can take right now in order to deal with that problem, you know. And so I guess my question is, is there so... Is, is it so difficult, given the cultural control over this like shamefulness of piracy or of jailbreaking or hacking your devices, that it makes it much more difficult from a communicative aspect to try to persuade people to accept that other side? Do you understand what I'm asking? Uh, yeah, I, so I don't know that it's, it's so much a, a shame. I certainly don't, I, I don't, I haven't directly experienced that shame. I think that there's a sense of hassle. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's uh, a often um, a lack of awareness that it's even possible, right? Like, if I think if you expect young people to seize the means of information, you must first inform them that there is a means of information. Right. And young people often don't know that there is a means of information for the same reason that fish don't know there's water, <laughs> right? Um, and so you, you, I think that, you know, there's that Douglas Adams quote, anything invented before you're 18 was there forever. Anything invented after you're 18 is the most revolutionary technology of all. And anything invented after you were 30 is horrible and needs to be prohibited. And, <laughs> and I think that um, young people have an assumption, you know, if you can't come of age with Facebook, you have an assumption that the way that you do social networks is like Facebook, right? And surely this is the way that it's always been done and always will be done, and not just a, a kind of moment in the design arc of social media mm -hmm. right, where that that's optimized around a certain kind of business model a certain kind of advertising market and that you know will be will will rise and fall as gloriously as you know six degrees and um uh, uh you know friendster and and myspace <laughs> and all yeah. the other um we mm -hmm. used to call them yasnesses yet another social networking mm -hmm. service mm -hmm. um and so uh, i think that that to to get to the point where you understand that this isn't the way it is because of some kind of inevitability that you know like the like the the reason the reason Facebook has these features is the same reason that a tripod has three legs because like <laughs> how, you know if it had fewer it would it would fall over and if it had more it would be superfluous right. um, that Facebook has these features because someone said this is the number of legs that Facebook needs yeah. um, and that there's no there's no like kind of physical limitation around it mm. Um, once you figure that out, once you realize that there's other possibilities, then you have the opportunity to start thinking critically about how you will use your knowledge of those other I facilities. I like that. So educating so, people about what's out there gets them mm -hmm. to a place where they can be open to that. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is what writing novels sometimes does, is it is it exposes people, not as a nonfiction book would, to the facts of the world, but rather to the keywords that you put into a search engine to find out what the facts of so, the world are. As a, as a novelist, and this is a question that's interested me very much about the generation that I'm somewhat part of, uh, and I guess it's not a question that one could answer scientifically, but as like an author and as a novelist, what do you think is the effect of people who grew up with Facebook and uh, similar social media sites as kind of the background of existence? Do you think that there's a particular kind of social effect that that has? I don't the way that know. It's... I don't know what it is. I mean, I think we're, I think that it's too pat to say, oh, well, people don't understand what privacy is worth or whatever. I mean, uh -huh. it's true that we, like, we have a hard time pricing privacy, but we've always had a hard time pricing mm -hmm. privacy, you know, and that video you mentioned earlier, I told a story about my, my grade three teacher who um, went into hospital with his wife when, when they were having their baby, 
and um, uh, had a baby, and there was no problems with it, and they were in the recovery room, the maternity ward, and a man came in for, with a, from a marketing firm, he had a basket with warm geese and diapers and cream and powder, and he said, you can have this basket, and all I want from you is your baby's name and your address, and you did it in her date of birth, <laughs> and I'll send you, which happens in every maternity ward around the country. Really? That's not oh, a joke. Yeah. No, that's normal. That's <laughs> no, totally just normal. hyperbolic. And we'll just send you, and we'll just send you, like, stuff every year, because, you know, your lives are changing, and we, we want to reach out to you, and, and you know, people routinely do this, right? And he did it, and his wife did it. But what they didn't know was that six weeks later, their baby was going to die. And that every year thereafter, on their dead baby's birthday, they would get a package of marketing materials and a birthday card from these marketing companies. And so it's really hard, right, a priori. Like, who is sitting there going, oh, well, you know, uh, it, that sounds like a good deal, but what if my baby dies, right? Like, what kind of monster holding right. their newborn in their arm would have that as their first thought? And um, having learned that lesson the hard way, how directly applicable it is, is it to the next privacy bargain that they're asked to make, mm -hmm. right? Our privacy decisions are separated by so much time and space from uh, their consequences. It's, it's impossible to iterative, iterative, iteratively improve your privacy practices. Which is where the smoking example comes in. Yeah, and so I gave the example of smoking. No one would smoke if you got a tumor with every puff. Right. No one would eat cheesecake if an ounce of cellulite appeared with every forkful. <laughs> right? It's it's that long gap between time and space that makes it very hard for us but to do But what's the effort. corrective to that? Well, I, there, you know, with public health problems, we do lots of different things. And these, I think we can call this a public health problem. Sometimes we... Um, we, we put out graphic warnings. So sometimes, education, generally? Yeah, we sometimes we regulate what kind of choices people can make. You know, we say you can't give cigarettes to kids. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we um, uh, give people better tools to, to deal with it, to get away from it. So, you know, right now your browser has, like, no way for you to negotiate a privacy bargain, right? The privacy bargain is take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. And, like, every game theorist will tell you that take it or leave it never produces an optimal mm -hmm. outcome in a negotiation. You can't block, thir you can't say intelligently block third party cookies to get rid of all the stuff that, that tracks me, but leave intact all the stuff that, that I makes my useful. life convenient. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that, that just isn't there. And, and to the extent the stuff that makes my life convenient is there, um, uh, give it enough information to make my life convenient, but withhold any information that might come. You know, if you remember the history of pop-up blockers, there was a time when nobody wanted to make a pop-up blocker because everybody was worried that if, every browser vendor was worried that if you made a pop-up blocker, all the websites that were depending on the high CPMs they got from block from pop-ups would de-optimize their site for that browser, and so the Internet Explorer customers would become Mozilla or, or um, right. Netscape customers, or vice versa. And it was only when Mozilla came along, which was a nonprofit and didn't really care about any of this stuff and just cared about users, that they made a browser with a pop-up blocker. And then um, suddenly, having having broken that little uh, <laughs> that little game theory problem, sure. the other two immediately had to follow suit they because to. they were both worried about losing customers to Firefox, mm, right? As right. they should have been. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I know we're running we're running short on time, so uh, what, just two final questions. Uh -huh. One of them is from an EFF activist in Los Angeles. Uh, her name is Katrina Kaiser, and she asks about. Uh, 3D printing uh -huh. and what implications 3D printing might have on the copyright war, um, and then and then the last question that I have is just I, you made this comment in the talk that you just gave downstairs about uh, how people can get involved at all levels of of this major issue that we're facing in terms of our future. Um, and I mean, obviously there are a lot of great organizations and I, as a final comment, I was just wondering how you felt the Pirate Party fits into that right. arrangement. Sure. I guess. So uh, starting with your first question about 3D printing, the first pass of this is very easy. You know, we'll have people who are circulating uh, um, 3D files that describe objects that, are, uh, that have uh, encumbrances and patent, trademark, and copyright. There will be lawsuits and panic. But that's like such a uh, a boringly easy prediction. That's like saying, <laughs> "Oh, you know, you've got movie theaters and you've right, got, record you've got companies cars." Are well, no, you've got movie theaters and cars. Someone will make a drive-in, right? right? And you know, there's like the second order one, which is we're going to have like um, uh, 3D printed guns and meth labs, and that's right. that's like, oh well, once you have cars and uh, and movie th and screens, you'll have drive-ins and you'll get the sexual revolution. But like the third order stuff, which is where all the interesting stuff happens, I have no idea, right? And that third order stuff is like, oh, you'll have cars and screens, which will create the sexual revolution. So in order to get Get late, you'll need to get a driver's license, and for the first time in the history of America, everybody will be carrying identity papers, and the database nation will be born. Right, right, and so like <laughs> that's that, 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 sex, right? that, that's that sex, third sex level sex is the thing that we, that we don't get. And then your other question was um, 
Uh, where does Pirate Party fit in? You know, I don't know. I've, I've talked to a lot of pirates. I've been to Pirate Party International Congress and spoken there, and I know Rick um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, from the pirates and so on. And I guess um, for uh, I, I, I think that pirates have done some pretty amazing things in the elections that they've won. Sometimes they've dissolved in internal bickering, but that's, sure. what, that's right. what happens. Yep. Yep. But what they've also yep. done is I think they've really put a fire under all the other parties about the potential for losing the youth vote and right. losing the informed technology vote to them. And I think that, that the Pirate Party is, is shifting the goalposts. And I think that what looks like a techno-moderate these days is a lot more like EFF. Right. And when I joined EFF, people used to call us the everything for free party. And, and you know, say so that like all EFF wanted was, all EFF cared about was like abolishing copyright. And I'm like, no, there's actually people out there who are kind of semi-copyright abolitionists. And they've got a whole political party. Right, EFF and they hate just, us. Because they think that just, we're compromising. Yeah, we're, yeah they're, we're compromising. <laughs> EFF, they're, they're like, we're reformers. So, yeah, right. so I think that you shift the debate too. And I think that's very useful. That's now, cool. the very last question, because we've got to let the staff go home. Sure, sure. Um, my very last question is how you... Uh, uh, feel the intersection of your role as a science fiction author and as also a social critic. What, sure. How do you feel like those two things come together I think and perhaps have tension? Yeah, well, I don't think they have tension. I think no. science fiction yeah. puts meat on the bones of abstract argument. Mm -hmm. That, like, 1947, people want to put cameras everywhere, and your only argument about it is, well, that would be creepy. It would make me feel weird. And that's a very kind of abstract and weak mm -hmm. answer to, why shouldn't we be men as gods and see all things that happen everywhere in the earth, right? <laughs> right. And, and then Orwell, 1948, <laughs> writes and publishes uh, uh, 1984, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you can say, no, your camera plan is Orwellian. And you right. get to import the entire narrative about, about how it mm -hmm. feels as imagined by Orwell and as transmitted into the brains of all the people who'd read him, uh, how it feels to live under that kind of regime. What about the other way around? How do you feel your role as a social critic makes you a better sci-fi author? I think the two of them are just intimately related. I don't think they're actually okay. disentangleable. The job of a science fiction writer is to imagine how technology is changing the world and, and try and show you how it's happening using these contrafactual examples. And the job of an activist, especially a technology activist, is to use technology to change the world. So they're so intimately related, I don't think they can be teased out. Huh. Awesome. All right. Cool. Thank Good you so night, much. Gang. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank you so much. much for